Hi there, welcome to Cloud Native Skunkworks. This is a video about Finout. We're doing a deep dive today on a company that is providing observability for cloud economics. It's a subject which many of us, including myself, don't know a great deal about. I know that at the end of a month, I look at a bill and I try to match that bill as closely as possible to the budget that I've been given to spend. However, Finout want to change that on its head, make it more interactive, and really to pull it in line with the FinOps movement, which is an idea that we care deeply about the budgeting, the economy, and also the cost reduction uh, of our footprint in the cloud and on-prem as well. So with that in mind, it's important to understand firstly, you know, what is FinOps? FinOps is an iterative journey about bringing your organization to a place where you care deeply about the visibility of your costs. You're talking about measuring services as unit costs and trying to operate within those parameters. It's also trying to bring to light the idea that there are many different types of personas that operate within the cloud infrastructure environment. You'll have product owners who are benchmarking decisions based on the cost of unit overhead they have. For example, if they want to add a cool new feature in, but it's going to cost $5 an hour to run, they're going to have to then match that up against the uh, annual return on that account and figure out if there's a cheaper kind of feature they can implement to achieve a better return on their investment. So these are the kind of things that we're now starting to think about. And to be quite honest, it's only something that through the tooling of something like FinOps and FinOut together, can you think about in a very concise and simplistic manner. Now, I'll say that a bit more further on, but first, let's just talk about who FinOut are. So FinOut are a Tel Aviv-based startup. We have our three founders here. We have Roy, Asaf, and Yazar, and their team, who are developing this product to effectively make people's lives a bit easier in terms of understanding in a single pane of glass what's going on. What I really like is that there's a real gusto behind this towards making it simple. There's also this idea that you don't have to run agents. So with many of these observability tools, you have to run agents in your clusters, whereas what Finout are doing is they're leveraging the APIs on these cloud providers. And so they can query in real time from the API on their side uh, without burdening you with that overhead. And that's really cool because you know that's one less thing I have to care about. And it also means I can budget with a set of keys that I use towards Finout operations versus installing it anywhere. The next piece that I wanted to draw your attention to is here, this whole how does it work section. I really like this because this is effectively what I'm going to talk to you about in four simple steps. You get this Megaville overview with your filters, your groups, all of the cool functionality, including downloads and YAML-based exports uh, and implementation through code, uh, you know, as uh, YAML as code. You've also then got enrichment, which covers things about forecasting, um, also looking at what does the data mean in very easy and consumable ways. Unit costs, which I touched on um, just a moment ago, this idea that you can work out um, a cost per unit, you can set a KPI and understand, hey, are we working um, within the parameters that we've set for this particular customer or segment? The cost per tenant here, where you have this idea, as I mentioned as well, that you can figure out your margins you're going to make. So it's really, really nice to see this broken down into ways that are accessible for folks who don't necessarily know a great deal about this area or want to get started, but just don't know where to make the best amount uh, or, the, or the greatest amount of impact. So with that said, let's flick back to that screen I had a moment ago and take a look at the platform itself. So I'm going to break this down into four sections. We've got effectively the total cost window, business context, cost per customer, and dashboards. And we'll go through all of these. But firstly, let's just recap on who is FinOut for? Well, I mentioned this idea of executives and product leaders and engineers all coming together, but I think it's slightly more interesting than that. You have this idea that this is now creating the instruments to generate signals for your SRE workflows as well. Just imagine if your cost per unit spikes up 100% overnight and you're spending $10,000 on a particular service. You would want somebody to get out of bed for that, just like you would if your service goes down, because that might indicate that a feature that's been released isn't optimized and is perhaps scaling up horizontally or is consuming a lot of vertical RAM on a single node and it's having to um, readjust the infrastructure dynamically for that. So it gives you that kind of new contextual data around the economics 
of the way that you've shaped your infrastructure. So that's super interesting. But then we also can think about the other personas in this matrix. You've got folks now such as accountants who are being brought to the table and are being able to start to look at where does the financial footprint map to in terms of the digital estate across regions, right? Where are we spending the most? And traditionally, this would be done through an export of CSVs, a lot of work being spent in just computing that and going through it in a very arbitrary and laborious process. But now you can do it through queries and selectors. And I mentioned you can codify a lot of these queries and filters and start to talk about them. So I think that the personas we're starting to open up here are going to have two unexpected outcomes. Firstly, you're going to see that you have people talking to each other from across the business from completely different uh, business units. You're also then going to start to see an organic exploration through the tooling to start looking at things that are available to them to explore to answer their questions. So let's start with the total cost. So total cost here is combining AWS and Snowflake. And this is a really nice place to start because remember what I said about this idea of this mega bill. This couldn't be more simply put than in this page here, right? You can see very clearly what we're looking at. Total cost, oh, okay, my Kubernetes clusters, I can break those down, apply a filter. I can instantly now see the average daily cost um, and on, on demand as well. And you've got a little um, tooltip here telling you what it means. So for example, spot instances, how many of mine are spot instances versus pre-allocated? Again, it's really easy to use. It reminds me of the Grafana UX. I think folks who come from an observability background will think this is very uh, similar with a date picker. We can also go and look at pre-built pre views, which I really like. Um, there's also this integral component in Fenout, which is sharing. This idea that you can save a query, you can share a query, uh, you can create a link, and you can get your team involved in this activity. Uh, you know, I think observability of your cloud infrastructure, especially the economics, is a team sport. And so this is done really nicely. We can see that EC2 is operating here. I can very easily switch around and pick different date ranges. I can switch my views, my formats. I can even download it in the traditional CSV. You'll see as well, we get this very tantalizing ad widget dashboard, which takes my current filters and groups and my date ranges, and it creates them in a widget. And we'll talk about that a bit later on. I won't go through all of these components here, but what's also a really nice one is this idea of gigabytes received. This is a very typical kind of thing to be looking at and wanting to audit uh, in, in real time. And so if we go down and we look at, for example, our account name, we can start to look at what is the cost connected to these accounts that we have. In this particular scenario, I have one account, so what I can do is I can transpose this table, and then you can see that I've got that over time, which is really nice because it gives us the simplicity of being able to perform quite a, um, a complex and specific, almost a surgical query in a very easy way. Equally, I can go back and look at Kubernetes labels, which are generated, which is very cool, and I can search that way as well. So it's nice to see that we have the ability to start leveraging different types of metadata within our infrastructure. So you've got your AWS level metadata and your Kate specific metadata. So if you know that all your customers are running inside of your Kate's clusters, you're probably going to want to leverage the labels in there because that's where you're spending your most amount of effort annotating the different services and namespace, especially if you're running a multi-tenant architecture. So in this case, you can see that in a multi-tenant architecture, we have much more fidelity around who is um, sending data and how much is it costing, which is great. So let's move on from total cost and think a little bit more about how do we translate this into stuff that we care about as a business. Well, that's where this business context uh, pain comes in. If we go back to Gigabyte Received, we'll see that this is a slightly different flair to it. So this time, if I go to Kubernetes, I label it, and I go to my account name label. What we can see here is it looks very different on the graph. And you think, okay, well, what's going on here? This is because we're looking at unit price. Now the unit price you more or less want to keep consistent, okay? So that's the price of the unit, which should go up or down only if there's been an event of change. It's really interesting that you can see that they're basically flat apart from these ones where the unit price shot up for this period of time. Again, you can capture as well the KPI. So the number of KPIs per day in the query. These are the more advanced features that are gonna to start to bring that intersection of cloud economists 
DevOps infrastructure engineers, product owners, and other secondary stakeholders who care about the cost of what you're doing and the return on investment. So this is a really interesting area within the product, and I'm excited to see that even at this early stage, it looks and feels really mature. Again, I'm a novice at this, and I can navigate my way around, and I can understand the meaning that it's giving to me. As we go down now here, at the start of this video, I talked a little bit about this idea of ARR, right? Inputting your effectively profit for the year, what you're going to make. Um, and then what you can do is it can figure out what is your margin you're going to generate based on labels per customer. So you'll remember that my Johnson Steel and Garcia was a customer in my gigabyte received. And you'll see here that it will calculate the total cost of this customer across queries and gigabytes received, which is really, really cool. All right, like it's amazing that you can see the cost of a customer to run in your cluster. I couldn't have asked for it to be put better than this, and it's a complex thing to show this data. First and foremost, like this is a lot of data we're dealing with, and it's challenging to represent that. So I like what they've done with these um, little graphs that you get to see the cost trend, right? So you can see one's going up, one's going down. That's really, really nice. I think that's a really good touch. And again, this all harks back to this idea of the platform feeling very much built around DX. I know I showed it earlier, but I'll show it again. Um, you have these nice tool tips, you know, around what you're doing. And what's really cool as well is that you have this ability to take um, the query as code. So you can take it out into YAML and then you can codify that to then create your own set of query filters later on. And that will play into the next piece that I want to show you. So this is where we come to, I think, the jewel in the crown, dashboards. These dashboards are awesome. This reminds me of Grafana, and I, I, I feel unashamed to say that because that's like the gold standard, right? Something like Grafana or Datadog, you've got now this ability to create your own dashboards. And what surprised me was the level of maturity, being able to actually move them around, reconfigure them, position them, make them look great for what I want, right? And actually then edit that widget, um, change the filters, the query, really, really nice. And these dashboards are super important because Imagine we're in a startup, we're in an office, we're working day by day, we have a budget of approximately $1,000 a week we've got to put our infrastructure in for. You are going to care on the daily basis, are you trending towards overspend or underspend? If you're underspending, that could be the difference between being able to spin up another experiment or having to try and go into cost reduction mode. So I love that we're starting to see the financial side of the observability coming to light. And I'm really excited as well, because if you think about looking at this, the next step here is naturally going to be having thresholds. This idea that you can set thresholds, alerts, build it into your workflow, right? I might want to have this go out to an alerting system where I can then say on Slack, hey, guess what? This has just gone over your unit cost cap for the day or for the month or for the year. Let's figure out why that is and let's make something happen to suggest otherwise, you know? So I think there's definitely a lot going for this. If we were to also recap, if you come back to some of the parts I didn't show you here, you have these idea of things like AI models. This is interesting as well because in the example um, production environment I'm in here, we have technologies such as Airflow. Um, and when we start to look at Airflow in operations, so let's go down to resource. We can see that there are a lot of costs that don't naturally get um, associated with a service. So with something like Airflow or Loki or Prometheus, there is an inherent EC2 transfer cost because you are sending uh, data to object storage remotely for backup, for uh, archiving, for retrieval, for compression. I think what this helps us to do when we start to have folks who are thinking about this is it starts to tell more of a cohesive story that simply deploying a service out isn't just the cost of that service, right? So when I build a microservice architecture, it's not simply running those pods. It's all the associated managed services. It's all the associated interactions with those services and then the customers who are on top of my services as well and how much of the quality of service they are demanding versus others, right? Is one customer who's interacting with my API a lot going to cost me more in transfer fees? So this has given me a lot to think about. I hope you like this video. I'm pretty blown away by where this is going. I think that it's opening up a really new, interesting direction. I said that this is creating 
instruments to generate signals for observability. And I think that's true in that we're starting to use the financial element of our digital footprint in the cloud to help us all become cloud economists. And I think the outcome of that is we'll become a bit more savvy about where we're spending our money. We'll become a bit more expectant of something better than Cost Explorer in EC2 and some of the other platforms. And we'll also start to think about how do we project and forecast and pre-allocate before the demands are there for our particular services in terms of putting aside that budget or even making the case for budget in the near future of looking at the trends of where we're going and also with the idea of understanding the query demands and what the cost of a customer is. I hope you've liked this video. I've really enjoyed making it. Please do like and subscribe. And as ever, if you want to check the tooling out, please go to finout.io. Otherwise, I'll see you soon. Thanks.